Hey there, new recruits. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. Hope it doesn't bug you, and you better be able to bear it, because we're going to hobnob with some goblins today on WebDM. Let's talk about some goblinoids, both um, just in general, and then uh, we'll move on to them as a playable option. So we covered goblins like, gosh, ages ago, and in like a same episode as maybe kobolds and for some reason bullywugs. Like, then, I don't know, maybe I was feeling bullywugs as being like the comeback monster of fifth edition, but... It was like different kind of small scrappy monsters is, I oh, think yeah, that was yeah. the reason for the grouping. <laughs> With goblins, they're not just any old player race, right, mm -hmm. or, or option. The trio of bugbears, goblins, and hobgoblins Goblins. They're they're so iconic to D and D yeah. and just fantasy gaming in general that you really just can't change them without changing something about the whole setup of this thing because it's yeah. sort of assumed that there's this stock of evil humanoids out there that you can just slaughter indiscriminately mm -hmm. for XP and adventure. I mean that and orcs, right? <laughs> sure. Like, I mean like these guys more, and orcs. Yeah, and settings other than D and D, the, the goblins and orcs are maybe more closely associated. So a lot of what we say here, you could also apply to orcs as well, if, particularly if you're willing to move away from like the baseline lore of these monstrous uh, humanoids. Let's get into some of that baseline lore. Like these these three races interconnected by, what would you call it, like deception? Deception, right, a long con. <laughs> Very long con, <laughs> yet another race that's been effed over by a god. Second edition had a great word for these kinds of creatures. They were just called powers. Even deity was a bit too, uh, you know, investing them with something. So Mag Magubliet, Mag Maglubiet uh, is a greater deity of the uh, of goblin kind. Reading between the lines, it's a story of what appears to be like some kind of deception as this creature like enslaves and convinces the other uh, gods of the goblinoids or I guess in that time they're not even goblinoids they're just goblins hobgoblins and bugbears and destroys their cultures erases everything that came before them no one even remembers what their separate and individual cultures were like or why one of them had goblin in their name but they weren't goblin you know and then it's created this like society or culture that's forged around uh, this religious identity that mm -hmm. Maglubiet imposes upon his new subjects and keeps select gods from their past but has told them basically you work for me now and, yeah. and they're not the kind whatever sort of gods these these creatures were so in reading the story of Volos I, I start thinking of things like all right number one what was what were things like before then and is there anything we can mine from that or the fact that there was a pre evil humanoid past to, to goblins. They were nice guys beforehand, you know. Who knows what they were like. Picnics what? every Friday. Could have been a paradise. The standard, um, you know, an evil god has shown up and corrupted this people and now that's why we have evil humanoids to kill. And if you're going with that, like, cosmic black and white, good and evil style of heroic fantasy, then that's a satisfactory experience, right? Like, yes, of course, there are evil deities out there and humanoids or whoever who willingly and nevertheless enthusiastically uh, worship them and follow their rules, and that's like bad, right? You know, a cosmic balance, a war going on that we, we can't allow that. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way is, is through the lens of the goblin kind being a you know, a mistreated and cursed people like drow or orcs. Dwergar, another one that, that spring to mind. And it's just like, there's something interesting in that. Even if you're not going to change a lot of the baseline lore that you find in Bolos or the Monster Manual or whatever, it gives you fodder for complexity and nuance with these creatures. And uh, to me, enough reason to like elevate them to just another culture in the world. I really like goblins, I like the lore behind them, the sort of themes of, of trickery and deception, of just being like sneaky little gits. Like extending that to say bugbears, to me bugbears and goblins are, are more of a kind than goblins and hobgoblins or mm -hmm. hobgoblins and bugbears. And bugbears just like a, a big goblin, right? A big hairy goblin. A goblin with a little <laughs> hair on his chest. Right. It's worthwhile to like explore the the possibilities of them right and bring them out of these dank caves where they ambush mm -hmm. you know low-level parties or threaten you know, villages and the like and think about how they fit into everything and, and and why in the world you would want to elevate them 
from from this evil humanoid to something else. Well, they, they could quite possibly want to throw off the shackles of, <laughs> of said a-hole god, you know? Right. So before we move out of that, though, before we move out of, like, Volos, was there anything in about the, the standard sort of, like, goblin lore that caught your eye or something that you would build on? Where you would put them in the world is, I mean, they're a very militaristic society, mm. but to me that just screams, like, samurai. I know they're often depicted that way. Especially but, hobgoblins. Yeah, hobgoblins. The style of armor. Yeah, the style like of armor they have and all that, but, like, definitely they would would be that type of power. Hell, I'd probably put them on an island nation also mm-hmm. and just, just like, like lean into it. And they have their little goblins that go out and pearl dive and, and go fishing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, you know, the bugbears are just like laying around in the shade. Loafs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being taskmasters to the goblins. <laughs> yeah. Get some more pearls. Bring sure. them back. <laughs> Sip it on their mojitos. I find it odd that the, the both the hobgoblins and the bugbears were both tricked. That story of, of how Maglubia does it, yeah. I bet there's some deep lore in second edition, like the Monstrous Humanoids book that was there. There's all, yeah. been all kinds of like demi-human deities type supplements that, mm-hmm. that explore these monstrous gods. I wanna, would want to run the Goblin Revolution. Right, yeah. That, that like interests me more than anything. You could build around like the Nilbog, that concept that the goblins have of the, the, the possessing spirit of this prior culture. Maybe there's a, a goblin like caster out there possessed by the spirit and then then they are connected with this past that they had. And mm-hmm. Yeah, they could leave some sort of throw off the shackles of this religious tyranny that they live under, right? And establish a new goblin nation. There's some big questions about uh, goblin kind that I like to think about when, when mm-hmm. I'm sort of considering their place in the world. And, and the first one is, like, why keep them together in the first place? Yeah, do they right? have to? Like, do they have to be? When you separate them out, you can keep some of the baseline lore, right? So frequently what I'll do is say, like, Hobgoblins are a creature of the world, right? There is, they're, they're like orcs or humans or any others. Goblins and bugbears are a different thing altogether. They're they're fey creatures. They're mm-hmm. supernatural somehow and represent their more like uh, fairy tale aspects. So for me, like goblin would be gremlin-esque, sort of sneak about kind of creature, an impish figure. Goblin's the one that's exchanging your infant for a wooden statue or something like that, or a changeling. Goblins are the the foot soldiers of the armies of the Queen of Air and Darkness. Supplying babies to hags. Right, and on the night of the wild hunt, uh, you really need to be careful because packs of wild goblins will be, you know, out and they're driven on by their, you know, goblin king as it, you know, rides to, you know, satisfy the call of the blood moon. You know, that's the sort of story of goblins that I really like. Bugbear is that feeling of being stalked by a predator. You're basically taking something like a a panther or, uh, you know, a jaguar or a cougar or something and, and making it like a man. Investing it, to me, they're very feline, they're very lanky, powerful, and cunning without necessarily being sentient or, or sapient, right? Mm-hmm. And so you you might have them in your world as a stalking predator or beast. That firmly to me is like, well, how do you make player characters out of those? I, I just like that promise of them, right? And I think you can use that for your own concepts and things like that, which we'll get to uh, later in the video. Moving beyond like the, the fey goblins as, you know, fairy tale type creatures, asking yourself like, what is it that, if, if you're gonna keep them together, then what is it that makes them goblinoids? Mm-hmm. And is there something other than this model of Maglubiet's <laughs> religious, <laughs> you know, iron law uh, and and sort of scorched earth uh, methods being used against the goblins? Is there something else that you could use that ties them together and makes them all goblinoids? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I know for a fact that you have one that you do in particular. <laughs> yes, I. This is the one I use in, in the world of Razzle Sin. Um, the Empire of Oracala Palantine uses hobgoblins as as the uh, backbone of their armies, their legions. I pulled that idea from Kingdoms of Calamar books by Kenzer Company. It was a D and D setting that that features a very down to earth, very detailed sort of uh, fantasy setting. It has hobgoblins as just another creature in this multi people's empire. That was where I started, right? I wanted I wanted the hobgoblins to not be traditional enemies. I wanted them to be like accepted uh, an accepted part of society. And then to me, I was like, well, if I've got hobgoblins there, then I should extend that to sort of goblins. And goblins just became another small character race that you would play. Both of these things were like, I had players who wanted to play either hobgoblin or goblin characters, and I didn't want them to be like on the outs and and like one of a kinds. I wanted them to be like, oh yeah, you see goblins all over the market, and you know. 
you know, you go down to the Hobgoblin, you know, where most of the Hobgoblin, uh, you know, new recruits drink, and they're there, but they're not the only people there. They've got humans and dwarves and all the peoples that you would see in a fantasy setting. And then, like, much later on, after I'd already established this fact about my world, that goblins and hobgoblins have a place in it, I had pretty much said bugbears were, I don't really worry about those, I didn't have a place for them yet. I hit upon this idea of this, a goblin never stops growing. That simple fact was like, a goblin just, they never stop growing. And each of these three uh, races then represents a snapshot in time of a goblin's uh, physiology. And then it, for me, it became an outgrowth of like, well, if that's a fact about their biology, like if they never stop growing, what would that mean for their culture that would develop out of that? How would they arrange their society? I like the idea of goblins being a more lawful type uh, society, whereas orcs are the more chaotic and, and unruly. Yeah. Goblins then get to be about goblin size while they're maybe five years old. They are sent out into the world to learn as much as they can. And for about 20 or so years, they're just goblins, as you would understand them. Mm -hmm. Because they're still relatively young, in my mind, the goblin attitude or mindset is one of like sink or swim. It's very like pragmatic and seemingly ruthless, but is designed around creating a, a type of person who will be able to withstand the, the uh, turmoil of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a kind or compassionate lifestyle or, or, or attitude, but it's also not like needlessly cruel. So goblins are merchants, travelers, tell tales, they wander the highways and byways of the empire, they are adventurers sometimes, or tinkerers, they, they engage in tasks that satisfy their curiosity and their need to be moving and learning and things like that, but they also have a, a bit of a, a wicked streak to them, they also enjoy pranks and, and uh, little cruelties. I, I didn't want to get into like kinder territory, but I still wanted to stick with that like sneaky little git kind of thing. Uh, well, that, I mean, they're turned out when they're kids, so you basically, know, right? Yeah, they're that. turned out. Yeah, it'd be like, yeah, you're turned out when you're 15 to make your way in the world and and given not really any structure. And then by about the time a goblin's 20, they're starting to get older. They're taller. They're mm -hmm. a little lanky. Starting to build some muscle yeah. mass. It's time for the growing. It's time for the growing. <laughs> and so a young goblin at that age begins to seek entry into one of the cohorts, which are a prestigious sort of fraternity and you apply for entry. And those who are accepted are entered into the cohorts, which they uh, you know, undergo several years of training. And when they come out of that, you would use a hobgoblin for those stats. And so in my mind, I would, if, if I had a player who played through the entire thing, I would let them change their character as they advance through the different stages of life. Or if they wanted to play like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with my goblinhood. That's my character's background, first level. I'm about to become a hobgoblin where I'm about to reach that stage of my life where you could call me a hobgoblin. And then a bugbear is just a goblin who's had like 80 years to live and has 80, 80 or more years of goblin experience of being of having to make their way in the world as a tiny little goblin or be, or serving in one of the cohorts. In this particular world, to serve in a cohort, you either join the legions or you join the imperial like bureaucracy, basically. Mm -hmm. One of the two, depending on your talents. And now you're a bugbear and you're like a patriarch or matriarch of your family and you're like yeah I'm, I'm the biggest goblin like eight or nine feet tall you know scarred ripped <laughs> I've learned how to sneak about and and to control myself and I've got you know the years and decades of cunning and, and ruthlessness that comes from living this life and so I use the stats of whatever it makes sense for right and would describe some goblins as looking like hobgoblins some bugbears as almost being goblin-esque and not necessarily these hairy brutes and that's one way that I answered it and, and the one that I've given maybe like the most thought to. The other way is just like you use whatever stats you feel like. A tall goblin's a hobgoblin, a short, a short bugbear's a goblin. You know like you just whichever stats you want to use you're just a goblin and yeah. bugbear, hobgoblin, goblin those are words that others impose upon us. We wouldn't necessarily call that that's sort of how it works in Land Between Two Rivers. It's not like the, the goblins never stop growing it's just they're like dogs right like there's a lot of different breeds of goblins and because Land Between Two Rivers takes place after this magical war that lasted centuries there's any number of magical experiments that performed on these people that they don't even know about that have produced the certain peoples that, that make up this wasteland. You know, maybe bugbears are just like, well, somebody took a goblin and they magicked it up till it was really big and aggressive. Right now they have to make their way in this uh, blasted, benighted hell world. I love the idea of the, of the host of goblins, right? Yeah. The hobgoblin legions and they're sending out 
scouts of bugbears, driving the goblin, uh, you know, uh, conscripts on with with lash and and barking wolves and mm -hmm. warg outriders. All of that iconography that that's just fun. The Red Hand of Doom adventure sort of really plays into a lot of that, and really like leans heavily into the hobgoblins as like uber Roman legionnaires who oh, yeah. just hate to have to fight. And then they've also got these allies, the auxiliaries of goblins and. Uh, bugbears that fulfill these niche roles and like that's fun but I also am like can we get an enemy humanoid that, that isn't deceived by a god into being evil yeah. in a in a world in which being evil carries with it disastrous consequences that's the thing that I'm kind of like eh, I'm done with that but the imagery I love because when you see the <laughs> goblin horde coming if you don't have any heroes around just go ahead and run you don't have any heroes around right maybe you want to use that imagery but you don't want it to be like monocultural right yeah and so you say like okay maybe this Magluviet is represents a new phenomenon there are people who remember what goblins used to be like and goblins come from a certain part of the world mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's like the concept of a womb of nations where there's just a blank space on the map. We know goblins live there, but we don't really know much about them. And occasionally, a group of them like decides to leave that area and interact with one of the peoples that kind of surround it and make an impression on them. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's peaceful, sometimes it's not. And for some reason, this new god that has come up out of nowhere, who's united all these goblin, different types of goblins into a massive horde and like required them to burn their idols to their old gods and erase their history books and forget everything about their past. I'm going to, you know, we are going to conquer the world in the name of this new god. Like that's different, right? Your goblins aren't static and, and, and never changing. They're dynamic and new. And even if you're going to use the stuff in Volos, it's not necessarily like the, this is all goblins. It's just the threat of goblins right now is this, this deity that's driven them onward. It reminds me, I guess, of the Covenant uh, in, in Halo in that respect. Hobgoblins are the elites. Mm. Goblins are grunts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bugbears are jackals. Sure. Or would it be vice versa? I'm, I'm going to betray my nerd cred. I've only ever played one of them, and I don't remember which one it was. Jackals were the guy with the shields. Oh, yeah, the grunts yeah. were the little yeah, piggy yeah. grunts. Oh, yeah, yeah. The and then the grunts. elites were with the swords. Even Halo, though the bugbears are bigger... It. Technically, than I can hobgoblins, see that. Uh -huh. but hobgoblins are more militaristic. Well, they're more disciplined. The hobgoblin is more disciplined. So the bugbears, the yeah, the bugbears more like you know, the barbarian auxiliary that yeah. you might have in the, in your legion. It's like you you have them there because uh, they're going to absorb some casualties. Send yeah. them in first. Yeah. Right. Like, let them go in first. They'll soften the enemy. <laughs> to me, if you're going to use the model of a Roman legion for your hobgoblin, I wouldn't do the Roman Empire. I would do a Republican legion. And, like, the early Republican legions were, like, five parts to it. So there's the skirmishers that go out in front, armed with slings, maybe bows, possibly javelins. They just harass the, the enemy. Maybe those are, like, the young goblins or young hobgoblins or something. The next one is the new, like, the, the raw recruits. And they're less well-armored, spear fighters, that kind of thing. And then, like... The more veteran are behind them, and then like the real veterans are behind them, and their job is just basically to make sure nobody runs away. And if it, things are going really bad, you might commit your old guard to the fight. They've been around a long time. They have the privilege of both being the most honored unit and the one that has to do the least amount of fighting. And then you have some kind of cavalry element to it: uh, war riders, horse riders, uh, whatever it is. I, you know, it, it talks about hobgoblin legions having violent mutant apes and things like that in it. So all sorts of like weird war beasts might be present. Well, that's your so, artillery. They're chunking rocks. Artillery. This is a fantasy game, so maybe you've got ogres and giants that would be the stand-in for catapults and ballista. If you want your army to be more on the move than having yeah. to carry around those siege weapons. Right. That's why yeah. you have giants. One of the monster manuals that literally has a catapult strapped to its back. <laughs> to its back, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those are the kinds of auxiliary monsters I might have. If a hobgoblin army is on the march, then you might look at the monster mail and go like, what would they just pick up and incorporate into their legion? Because if you are using the Romans as your base, the Romans were not shy about using whatever worked in mm -hmm. their legions, and they didn't care. Maybe <laughs> find a pack of like hippogriffs or something like yeah, that for exactly. some air calf. Exactly, yeah, all kinds of things. Thinking about that, all of that is there to, to figure out where goblins and everybody fits in your world, but any one of these things you could then tease out and work into mm -hmm. like a full-on uh, character concept. Thinking about PCs, why are you here? This concept that you want to bring to bear. Right. Like, how is it justified in this world? Is it up to just the PC to justify it? Is it up to the DM to work with them? You do have to start there. You know, if you're going to play, a, like, a, a monstrous humanoid like a, like a goblinoid, if you're in a typical D&D setting like Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms, then you might have to ask yourself, like, how are you even going to get in this city? Like, are they even going to let you in? I think it's sort of like the baseline for, say, like, not in the Mighty Nine. Oh, right? it's, like, I'm going it's right there. Skies everywhere. This is why thinking about... Um, 
you know, the place of monstrous humanoids in your world is so important because it's going to give the players who potentially want to use one of these options an idea for what sort of challenges they might face. And if monstrous humanoids in your world are evil, wicked, pariahs, that kind of thing, then you're, that's going to inform a lot of the decisions that your player makes. Maybe they, you know, play a more subterfuge-oriented character, someone that can be sneaky, disguise themselves, that kind of thing. Or they're just committed to being like, yeah, I'm never really going to be in town. I'm, I'm okay with that, you know. Yeah. I've, I've done the town game before. I'm fine. <laughs> Been run out. <laughs> I'm right. good. And, you know, if there's something like a caster or something, maybe they have access to a familiar or, or used to at least observe what's going on uh, so that their character and player is informed. Or you could just accept the fact that this player's fine not being a part of certain elements of the game. The other option is to just make these a part of your world and, and have it be no more uncommon that they're a goblin or a hobgoblin than they are an elf or a gnome. Mm -hmm. And that that's just the way things are. And you're prepared to accept those consequences for treating them as full-on cultures and not like stand-ins and, and pure enemies. What are, what are some of your favorite goblin concepts? My favorite goblin concept is a goblin caster. Specifically yeah. a goblin wizard. We're reading through at least the monster manual. They talk about goblins as being craven, pursuing power so they can lord it over others, and greedy and, and the like. I wouldn't want to take those traits to the point where they would make my character unwelcome in the group. But I would use those and sort of think like, well, of all the classes, that describes a wizard. The thing that I love the most about wizards is that they give a huge middle finger to gods, patrons, nature, <laughs> bloodline, everything. They're just like, screw you. All I need is this book and some time. Time, yeah. and I will be as good as all of you if not better. I like that and it appeals to me because the, to me I could easily see a goblin going like I'm just a small stunty little wretched thing and everything's gonna bully me and I, the only thing I got going on is being able to pick on kobolds. I'm gonna take this spell book and make something of myself. In my mind, like goblins are like gross, demented hobbits, right? So they have that same impulse of like making a house a home and like being cozy, but it's all gross, disturbing things like slimy little salamanders. You know, I use a chamber pot, but of course you can't just like leave that stuff lying around. So you have to seal it and I have my collections over there. You know, just <laughs> grossness is yeah. what I would uh, highlight with them. I like leaning into the whole fury of the small thing they got going oh, yeah, on. Yeah, a goblin it. barbarian. Just this little guy that you're just like, you know what? I just don't think I'm going to piss him off. Yeah. Any of the others, I don't care, but he just looks like he, he'll only take so much. Just come into it with the, with the rage of a thousand goblins. Right. They're stats kind of support the, at least the AC part of it. Oh sure, the AC part of it, the constitution uh, part. I mean, there's a lot about being a goblin that really sort of like works yeah. with Barbarian. Yeah. Because Barbarian's gonna like shore up some of the things that you don't, that you might not get from your stats. Mm -hmm. I also like that idea, right? Like, I, one of the things that, uh, about goblins that I've always appreciated is the way what Warhammer does them. And so Warhammer has those night goblin fanatics that like get hopped up on shrooms <laughs> and fermented psychedelic uh, fungus brew. Yeah. And then like wield these over Oversized ball and chains that they just sort of like spin into people. And I, I, if I were making a goblin barbarian, that's how I would do it. But like, yeah, my goblin barbarian, that berserker rage is not natural. Yeah, and, hey. and hey, DM, you mind if I just use a great axe anyway? Because he just, and I may just accept the disadvantage. I've done a small barbarian <laughs> before with Roscoe. Yeah. And that's why I love just the D8. Like the axe, oh, the yeah, battle yeah. axe, because yeah. you just do it two-handed. It's right. like you don't have that disadvantage. That would be the more effective way to do that. <laughs> yeah, I thought about doing a great sword that you just drags around. You just drag around, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And I can see a goblin being like stubborn and and sort of like belligerent enough to use an oversized weapon. The big thing for me with goblins is making sure that where the line between just being obnoxious mm -hmm. and being true to your character is with the group, and yeah. it's going to be different than from for everybody. And some groups will appreciate a kind of a character that's an instigator and a trickster, and others yeah. are going to be like, please stop. Another one for me would be like a goblin beastmaster ranger because I yeah. love small characters being beastmasters because you right. can get you can get that medium creature, yes. that medium yep. beast, oh, and yeah. ride him around. Just a little well, guy fits, who, right? like, yeah, he rides around wargs, and yeah. he calls it a warg. It's probably mm. just a wolf. It's really just a scruffy it's wolf. It's just a scruffy a wolf. <laughs> he sleeps with him. They're inseparable. So obviously he smells like dog all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's just, you don't want him around. There's fleas. Yeah. But, damn it, if the motherfucker can't track us, just, yeah. just, God, he can yeah, find anything. Can't. Almost anything can be made into a good concept with a goblin because I think goblins have that inherent comedy 
grotesqueness yeah. and then also they're pretty like in terms of their you know actual mechanics of being a goblin are pretty effective you have the juxtaposition of like you can be good at a lot of different things uh, with this particular set of abilities but also you're sort of inherently silly and yeah. gross you just you want to trip over yourself to success sure yeah and that's that's <laughs> where you get the comedy you get you're winning anyway so lamb tweet rivers we have both a goblin and we had a bugbear sadly r.i.p baloo gildan is uh, a wasteland prophet a goblin uh using domain of the wise for gods and goddesses supplement and essentially is like raised by baba yaga and with all of That's the abuse and emotional neglect that that would entail. So the, the player, uh, Grant Ellis, uh, on the game is great at sort of bringing out that goblinness of being like an instigator and sort of towing that line between like eye-rollingly and on again, but also like doing things to sort of shake up the game. And, and you know, his character walks around and starts projects, doesn't necessarily finish them. Uh, and and like begins cults, starts armies, tries to begin new religions, presents figures as prophetic, and it's a good example of like fulfilling that tricksterness, that that trickiness. You never know what's going to happen, and what exactly uh, mm -hmm. is going to be the outcome of all this uh, zaniness. But it's also not necessarily to the point where it's not true to the character and true to the sort of story behind the character. Of course, it's a cleric on top of it, so it's kind of like a you know. You're the natural badass that a cleric eventually becomes. So Baloo was a druid um, who, uh, you know, was sort of like this wasteland, you know, connected with the dying landscape and the like. But the way that my brother Josh uh, sort of portrayed him was very much as sort of a shiftless layabout, just kind of like a kind of a coward kind so of. So a bugbear. Kind of a but yeah, just always <laughs> lazy. Always made a point of when everybody else was like, oh, I'm I'm gathering wood for the camp or I'm setting up you know, a fire or I'm tending to this thing. <laughs> I was like, nope, Baloo is uh, sleeping or lying down or, you know, just recumbent somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when the action called for it was always, you know, usually we'd get bruised up and roughed up because he'd be like on the front lines fighting even though they're just a, a druid, and which is how he met his heroic uh, end, R.I.P. Baloo. It just was like a great way of portraying it because number one, caster a bugbear is way out of left field for a lot of people. They're going to look at that strength dex and go like, wait, I'm like, what? what? Why? Why? Yeah, why? But I think it worked because sort of had a, an orangutanus, orangutanus to him, obviously from the name. I guess not like Baloo was a bear. In the, uh, yeah. Book. But I, I also like the Louis was, Louis was the orangutan. <laughs> but that sort of like big orange hairy monster. Yeah. Was uh, what I liked about Baloo, and and sort of like showed that you don't have to be like this bloodthirsty, violent creature, as awesome as that is, that the bugbears can can lean into to have the sort of like big lumbering kind of goblin creature that, that bugbears also represent, right? They're also kind of goofy. I like going, leaning against that with, with my concepts. Because yeah. I, I, like for me, an assassin rogue or a shadow monk sure. is the way to go with the bugbear for Ooh, me. Yeah, and I'd even, I'd even sometimes multi-class that mm. and do both. Because be it would be a damn fine combo with the reach the extra damage without assassin. You're going for like the leading into the fact they get the dex bonus and sort of like you know maybe less on strength and mm. and just like really going hard for the stealth predator that has one attack in them because they're not there for the long haul. No, they're there to like knock out, punch, done, and slip back into the slip shadows. Back into the shadows. Yeah. When I think of like a, a bugbear rogue, is I like I'm missing a strength based rogue. Yeah. And I just think it's an archetype in fifth edition that could be well served by having something strong there because there's a lot of like sneaky and violent types that are also strength based and and bug. I like the fact that bugbears are a strength dex race. They it seems to me that maybe Ranger would be a good fit for them and, and some concepts you could go with would it work for Rogue? Maybe it works for Ranger. Like a bugbear gloom stalker. One who's at home in the dark underboughs of a forest or the you know the shadowy caves that they make their home in. Might even come up with a strength based rogue subclass so that you could get like a cool barbarian rogue out of a bugbear. Oh yeah. That'd be sweet. See now I'm just thinking of the uh, the gloom stalker bugbear. They call him Tommy two times because right. when the, when the army's on the march, you only see him two times when you set out and then we get back. No, he's out there. He's Nobody out there. ever sees yeah. him. The idea of a, of a bugbear strangler yeah. is one that I that really appeals to me. Just the idea that this big brutish long armed beast man would be like, no, I'm gonna gear up you. Like give me the wire. I want that, not the axe. Not the spear. Mm -hmm. You can keep the harpoon and the others. The wire yeah. is what I want. And 
I look at that and I go, why the strangling? I'd maybe lean into that and make the assassin for me, like, yeah, they strangle people. Maybe a grappler. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that I would do it. Not really thinking in terms of like class or, or what, what I would take, but just the idea of a bugbear who was left behind. They were wounded in a fight with adventurers, left behind by their kin, who yeah. are also their family. Let's not forget that, adventurers. Like, had to cut a deal with the adventurers so that he would live, and now leads them back to kill all of his old family, and it's just sort of like, well, what do I do now? I can't go back to being a bugbear. Everybody will know what I did. I'm not exactly allowed in Baldur's Gate. The sort of humanoid that has no place anywhere, and the life of adventuring is just kind of the only way they can make it in the world. I play a bugbear like that. The lost evil, evil race person that's going to be constantly judged by the mm -hmm. color of his yeah, fur and not the content great. of his character. It's never been done before, <laughs> and I think that I can give it a unique spin. Yeah, I think I think you should do Ranger. Yeah. Maybe a Beastmaster you could be easily Ranger do like two, yeah. with two, two swords. Yeah. Hobgoblins. For me, Hobgoblins obviously lean towards like an Eldritch Knight. Oh, sure. Right. I mean, Stats-wise, yeah. Yeah, you gotta you got send them to the, what is called the School of Devastation. I'm going to be a devastator. <laughs> They've got schools! They've got academies! They have academies. I'm thinking the Abjurer Wizard yeah, would also work well. Strong uh, core of Abjurers. Uh, 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 War Mage might be one that you take for the School of War. So, like, those are the obvious ones for Hobgoblin. And, and Hobgoblin, man, if Goblin's the short one, and, like, Bugbears are sort of the jock sad boy of the Goblin group, then mm -hmm. I really find Hobgoblins being, like, just the overachieving middle child. And yeah. it's like... You needed strength and intelligence mm -hmm. and like two and martial weapon proficiencies but light armor like what are we doing here i don't see what the archetype that would best be served by this other than an eldritch knight or a very narrow type of wizard oh, they right? want i was gonna say they want all their war wizards in armor at least right right, I mean, right. it saves a spell it saves a spell especially if you eventually get end up getting like say magic leather armor or something like that it might be you know up to par with mage armor but this might be one of those where i go we gave medium armor to dwarves and medium armor fits with like the imagery of hobgoblins mm -hmm. so why we could easily do something like you're trained in say one martial weapon and then these two types of armors or you're trained in a martial weapon medium armor and a shield like to me that fits with the hobgoblin militaristic mindset so i think maybe light armor is where i get tripped up there because it's sort of difficult to see which archetypes would best be served by it although there are a lot of them that would be served by having any two martial weapon proficiencies right like mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you might want to do with a you know, longbow or, or something just because you're like, all right, I have access to it. If they have that and then the save face and then that's really kind of it, right? Like there's yeah. not a lot else that they get. And I, I kind of feel like Hobgoblins, uh, at least mechanically, could use some love. Yeah, yeah, they seem a little underserved. You get the bonus when you miss just because you don't want to... Did, did be, anybody wanna, see that? Right, you don't want to <laughs> like, embarrass yourself. Yeah. What it does is it takes me back to the Haga Curry and I'm just imagining that hog... <laughs> That hobgoblin servant or, or vassal coming in and being like, I missed an attack, commit seppuku. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because I missed. And then, and then he botched that one. Then he messes he that up. It's like, I one. had to heal you. you you're going to have to commit yeah, seppuku to twice as hard next time. Yeah, I mean, they like, could be your, what is it called, the Kaishakunin or something like that? <laughs> the person that cuts your head off. Well, I mean, if you if you're if you're honorable enough, then you you are owed that to make sure that you have a good. Death oh sure, and, and then you live on as long as the snow doesn't melt. <laughs> Moving beyond like the fact that hobgoblins are like I would play a hobgoblin because I want to play a hobgoblin for the kinds of characters you would want to play with these. Mm -hmm. They they sort of enhance things. And so, looking at the Hobgoblin, I'm like, ah, all right, it's lackluster, not what I would want, but I'm, I want to play a Hobgoblin, right? I want to play a sort of disciplined type of character. Maybe, say, Klingon appeals to me, and I see more similarities between Klingons and Hobgoblins than I do between, say, Klingons and Orcs or something. Or you want to play, I'm not from around here sort of archetype, and, 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 but I'm from a warrior culture. Hobgoblin might work for that, especially if you combine them with, say, like, far traveler background or, or something uh, similar. There was a, a, a category of a, 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 like Roman legionnaire it was an honor to fight in front of the, the banners, right? To be considered brave enough and skilled enough, disciplined enough to not have to be able to see the thing that's telling us what to do. That might be a concept that I take over into Hobgoblins. Be like, yeah, I wasn't just a regular spearman. Mm -hmm. I was first spear of my cohort and fought in front of the banners as, you know, you know a skirmisher and a, a light warrior. And then I'd, you know, take my place in the ranks when we made contact with the enemy, but I'm 
of a class above the regular soldier. So maybe you take like champion or, or, or something like that. Really for me, I, I'm, I'm looking at militaristic uh, archetypes. Perhaps the hobgoblin was left behind after a hobgoblin invasion, left for dead. Pangans is now far from home. Uh, the hobgoblin armies were shattered. That, that That's long past. And now I sort of am I'm just here like what am I going to do? Uh, adventuring is a, a lifestyle of that. You might look at like military conflicts throughout history and what happens to say veterans afterwards or casualties that are unaccounted for. There's a lot of deserters or, or people that just get, kind of get left behind. All of those people could end up in the adventuring lifestyle as hobgoblins or any number of goblinoids if you're using a more traditional goblin route and now you're sort of playing a character that's a bit of a fish out of water, but also, you know, separated from their people, having to like adapt to life in the lands of the elves and dwarves and humans that they were once rampaging through. There's a lot of fun things there. There's a lot of tension that you could have and a lot of interesting things you could do in addition to like being a character that's maybe someone who's, now that they live in lands with other people and, and see how other things are done, realize like, wow, wow, this uh, whole bullying and, and, and <laughs> like terrorizing others maybe isn't the best way to live life. But I, I like the, the sort of like the martial value that came uh, with that. And, Finding a place for that character in your world could be fun and interesting. Any one of these would fit with a character concept like that, right? Mm -hmm. so. I feel like there's so much more we could even talk about with goblins, and here we are. We've gone on for so long, we just barely scratched the surface. Mm. Why, yeah. Goblins. Um, what do you know? Goblins. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. Want to see us play? We've got games every week on Twitch, which we upload to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. If you like the video, hit that subscribe button, click the bell, give us a thumbs up, and tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the morning supplication. As the broken God has bestowed upon us this lot in life, this bearing of the burden we bear it for you. Go in peace, be easy, knowing that your suffering is our business. For where there are devils, there is always suffering. And those of us who have followed the path of the broken God would punish those who would cause such wickedness in the world. For devils are surely wicked. And where there is a descent into hell, then the stalwart of Ilmater will be there to fight alongside our brothers and sisters. Come. Let us go. Ah, the web DMs have taken lives, I see. Yes. Claimed a few victims. That we have. I'm terrified now. You shouldn't. Wow. You shouldn't be. I should not. We are here to take your suffering from you. Are you? And those cookies. I see how it is. I can be bought for He's he's moving in on my territory. We need we need the supplications. The supplications. I like the spices. From one oh. from one cookie uh, purveyor to another. I can't I can't stay in character the way through I can. Just never could. That's why I'm the dungeon master. You're not staying character that long. Just two three minutes. Where are we right now? We are at D and D Live, Mr. Crawford. That was Jeremy Crawford. I could feel his suffering, acknowledging me, and I bore that burden.